Hello, Robert Bastian here from Laryngopedia and Bastian Voice Institute. A few weeks ago, I offered to do a Q&A on uh, questions that people would send in. And what happened was I had so many questions on so many different subjects that I thought I can't really put that into a single Q&A. So I picked the one that got the most questions, and that has that is RCPD. And so uh, the RCPD, we need a little brief uh, review for somebody watching this who doesn't really know what it is. And they're just, so what is RCPD? It's a dysfunction of the upper esophageal sphincter located mid to low neck. It's like a, a circular muscle, like a gate. It sits contracted all the time, except at the moment we swallow, it lets go to let us swallow. It also must let go to let us burp and to vomit, and that's the problem. It doesn't want to let go in the reverse direction, so retrograde cricopharyngeus muscle upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction. Uh, it's uh, when we can't burp either at all or sufficiently, it causes a whole list, a host of GI symptoms. And uh, so people tend to focus on the GI symptoms and overlook the idea that the, the central issue is that people can't burp or can't burp sufficiently. It's a syndromic diagnosis, meaning in 2023, it is not diagnosed by any test. It's diagnosed by match to a syndrome. What is the syndrome? Uh, it is, in a nutshell, we have four cardinal symptoms, can't burp or, or, or can only burp minimally, gurgling, which can be internal uh, that others don't hear, but more often it's uh, heard a few feet away, even across a quiet room uh, in severe cases. It can be quite loud. Um, with the mouth open, it's of course again louder. Bloating, we use that term primarily for the abdomen, that feeling of pressure and fullness and distension, but bloating also can have a manifestation in the chest and in the low neck, that feeling of pressure and bloating. Uh, and then flatulence is often major. Those are the big four, can't burp, gurgling, bloating, and flatulence. There are a, are a list of other symptoms that are very common, but not quite as universal. By the way, flatulence isn't 100%, but it's uh, the great majority. Painful hiccups, can't fill the lungs, a feeling of shortness of breath that's mechanical, uh, and hypersalivation, uh, constipation, and nausea after eating. Well, so you can see there are many doors into RCPD here in yellow. I have the primary four. But as a matter of fact, sometimes in a moment of distress from a sub-symptom, a person will go to the internet and, for example, <clears throat> they might look up nausea and because they're having it at that moment. Or maybe it's a, it's a very big or a bothersome uh, element of this whole syndrome. And so nausea may be their door into an understanding of RCPD. Well, the treatment of RCPD in a nutshell is Botox. It's a brief outpatient operating room procedure. A person is asleep for a very short time. We go through the mouth and inject the muscle through the mouth. Such a straightforward procedure. Uh, the person spends two hours maybe at a day surgery center. They go home and then they have the day to them themselves. Uh, in, in other words, it doesn't lay you up or put you in bed or anything like that. Uh, that's still my preferred method. I also have done a lot of office EMG. That's done through the outside, through the neck. And that can work quite well in people who prefer that method. Um, it, it works quite well in our hands also. And typically, this Botox treatment is not just a test. It validates the diagnosis, but it's a once and done treatment. Four out of five, approximately, get this done, and that's that. The Botox serves as training wheels that teach burping for life. Fascinating. All right, and to find out more, that's a, a very rapid, big picture treatment of our CPD. To find out more, you go to Laryngopedia, that's my personal teaching website, and type r-cpd into the little search window that is found right here and up comes this first there are actually a number of posts but this first one 
is comprehensive. It's got videos and, and uh, all kinds of information, all of the four articles that we've published on the subject. So that's for people who want more. So now to questions. Here's a person who says, I have RCPD. Uh, I think he said he was headed for treatment in some other place. Uh, but he said, I also have coughing fits. And I, of course, this is a question from the internet, so I don't get a chance to do any back and forth with the person. But the things that I gleaned are that some of these coughing fits can be violent, last up to five minutes. They're very sudden onset. And some of the time, the throat seems to close in and makes the person anxious. And it can even waken this person from deep sleep. Well, th that scenario is not a part of typical RCPD. So what this person probably has is sensory neuropathic cough. So again, big picture, I can't go into it in detail, but just type SNC into the Laryngopedia wi window and this very big post comes up. You see it even has a table of contents. So I have a feeling this person has RCPD and sensory neuropathic cough, two separate conditions. Here's a person who says, are there any plans for a control study, Botox versus placebo? Well, control studies, <clears throat> pardon me, are the gold standard in medicine. So ideally, in a perfect world, absolutely. It won't happen by me, uh, and I want to just explain why that is. We are three doctors and a PA in a private setting. That's why we are so efficient and inexpensive uh, for medical care because of that. And the problem, though, is that introduces issues for us to do studies like this. So I can't go into great detail, but just to kind of throw out some ideas about why it will be so hard to get that controlled study done. There's the problem of IRBs, institutional review boards. I sat on one when I was an academic physician. And oh my, you have to fill out all kinds of forms. You have to justify. You have to speak to the 10 issues, privacy to what are the risks, who's going to pay for what. So the very process of getting IRB approval, sometimes they re reject and you have to fix this and fix that. IRB approval is tremendously time consuming. It's also very costly. Uh, thousands of dollars typically to get through the IRB process. And now all I have is permission to do this as a controlled study, huge time and energy. I simply can't do that in my uh, institute. Second is there's an ethical problem when we are so deeply into success. So when you do a controlled study and one arm, the treatment arm, uh, shows clearly massive benefit, then it's unethical to keep treating the placebo people with placebo once you get robust results. Uh, let's say it's a cancer chemotherapy drug and you do placebo versus the, the drug or, or drug one versus drug two, and now you can see clearly that drug two is, is curing people uh, you know, much better than, well, you have to break the study. You have to, well, we have an ethical problem here because at Bastion Voice Institute, our group has done 1,330 people and the, the success rate in getting them burping and resolving all of their symptoms, at least for the first few months, is almost 100%. Now, nothing's 100%, but it's close to 100%. So how do I now say to a group of people, well, you may be getting the, the sham drug uh, when they are in misery? They're in misery, and they've read on Reddit and all over the place about how this, this, this massive relief of symptoms. So that's going to be an ethical problem. Um, uh, so thir 1330 with zero relief, by the way, from profuse testing and treatments elsewhere. Before people came here, they, I, I would say of that 1330 people, I would bet significant tests, meaning scopes and barium swallows and manometry and uh, stool cultures. And I, I would just pulling a number out of the air. I'll bet you among the 1330, there have been 10,000 tests done. Not one of them got the diagnosis. Um, 
when we match the syndrome, 100% get the diagnosis. And I'm saying 100% as being essentially 100%. So there's an ethical problem in, in uh, this. Uh, so, and those 1330 with total relief from Botox. And again, I'm, I'm leaving out a few uh, stragglers and outliers, but it's an overwhelming success rate. <clears throat> uh, now, for, <coughs> pardon me, one out of five recurs, but they got their diagnosis confirmed and they got their few months of uh, relief before they recur. So there's going to be a problem with recruitment of patients. Again, these people are in daily misery. How, how are they going to say, uh, yeah, I'll do this treatment and, and take the chance that I'm the placebo? Who covers the cost of treatment? If I'm taking someone to an operating room or doing an EMG, it's an expensive procedure. I think it's about $2,000 all told from first meeting to completion of the EMG here in the office, and it's about 3500 if we go to the OR and do the anesthesia and the Botox and everything in the OR. So who pays for that when it's a study? Uh, we'd have to get a drug company or somebody to, to support the treatment. Insurance companies aren't going to want to pay for that. So, um, and who covers the cost of all the data management and the writing? It's, it's tremendously time consuming to do this very important study. So I'm all for it in the theoretical world. I'm not a naysayer. I'm just explaining the, the difficulty of getting that study done. Any link between sighing dyspnea and RCPD? I have a feeling this person has read about the gasping syndrome, to my knowledge, first described on Laryngopedia. And so you can go to Laryngopedia and in the little search window type in gasping. Just that single word brings up this article from 2020. And uh, you can, uh, we've dealt with it for 20 years, but I thought I finally should just describe it. Uh, so if that's what the person means, the answer is no. There isn't a, there isn't a correlation between gasping syndrome or sighing dyspnea, if that's what the person means in RCPD. There is, however, definitely a shortness of breath issue. Uh, what is that shortness of breath issue? It's a, uh, it is a uh, mechanical shortness of breath. And here's just one of many images I could show you. You see the, how the diaphragm, that very thin muscle here that I'm outlining, that diaphragm is lifted way up by all this extra air. I'm showing you mainly the stomach bubble here, but you see there's quite a bit of air below too in the colon. So in order to increase the amount of air in the chest, I have to contract this dome-like muscle. I have to flatten it. And as I flatten it, I increase the volume in the, in the chest cavity, and that's how we breathe in. But when a person's diaphragms are pushed up by all of this extra air in the abdomen, and they, they say, I can't get a deep breath, I can't. I'm short of breath. It's that mechanical shortness of breath that is extremely common in people with RCPD. So mechanical shortness of breath, yes. Here's a question. Why does RCPD cause nausea? Well, that's a, a question that's, uh, I can only speculate on that question. But gastric dilation, you, you saw in that prior picture, that stretch of the stomach, gastric dilation is one thing that, uh, that causes nausea because it has an effect on the autonomic nervous system. We have the motor nervous system that lets me move. I can move using the motor system. Uh, I can sense by the sensory side, so there's a motor, there's a sensory, but there's also an autonomic. So the autonomic nervous system is involved when I flush, because I'm embarrassed, that's the autonomic nervous system. If I sweat, uh, that's the autonomic nervous system. If I'm frightened and my heart pounds, that's the autonomic nervous system. When I go to table and the food is very appetizing and smells wonderful and my mouth waters, that's the autonomic nervous system. Well, nausea is really a part of that system. 
And so uh, what I think is that the gastric dilation uh, is what's triggering that, that feeling of nausea that you get when you're about to throw up. And uh, so that's why I think it happens. And um, this may also help to explain the stretch of the GI tract, why uh, some people describe salivation when they get this, this all the RCPD symptoms, one of them is salivation. Or they'll say, when I get chest symptoms, my heart starts to race. Or a few have said, I sweat. And I think it's all through that autonomic nervous system. What is the link between RCPD and constipation? Well, first it's common. Constipation is, I'm sure, more common in people with RCPD than it is in the general population, but it isn't universal. So not everyone with RCPD has constipation. A number of them do. And those who do, I would say half of them say when they are treated, my constipation is so much better, but not all of them. Two speculations. Uh, one is that chronic stretching of the muscular walls of the colon diminish its squeezing ability that moves contents down the line. And this is true of all muscular organs. If you stretch them, they contract less effectively. You've heard of congestive heart failure. When the heart begins to fail, it often begins to dilate. So the wall of the heart stretches. And now, instead of the uh, nice firm heart going like this and squeezing 50, 60 percent of all the blood out, it's called the ejection fraction, the, the heart squeezes like this, and maybe the ejection fraction becomes 20 percent or 30 percent. The heart just doesn't contract as well when it's stretched. Same thing for the urinary bladder. And I think the same thing happens over time to the colon. Um, the second speculation is, uh, and this is uh, really my flight of imagination, the microbiome in the GI tract, uh, a lot of the organisms are anaerobic. That means they prefer to grow without oxygen. And uh, so now we're putting huge amounts of air through the GI tract, the flatulence, as I've said, can be extreme. We've had people with such extreme flatulence that they say, you know, doctor, it doesn't even smell. There's no odor uh, because the air just is going through so, so fast that either it doesn't pick up the odor or the, the GI microbiome is so different that the odor isn't the usual that we expect. So those are my two reasons. So if we've changed the microbiome, have we changed the consistency, the, the amount of breakdown of, uh, of what's in the colon? So to, to explain this in a different way, visually, take a look at this CT scan. This is across the pelvis. Here you see the ball joint, ball joint of the two hips. And this is a huge amount of air in the colon and I haven't measured that, but I think that's probably three times the usual diameter. And if, the, if it sits like that all the time, I mean, I take your colon, if it's normal, and stretch it like that once or twice or on occasion, I don't think that's going to. But when people are chronically in this stretch state, you, can you see that that chronic stretch would would thin out the, the muscle that's in the wall, there's muscle in the wall, and diminish the squeezing ability that moves the contents down the line and uh, for a bowel movement. Now, here's a question. My symptoms are bloating, so that we think of as mostly abdominal, but sometimes chest and low neck, and a feeling of a ball in my throat. So we have people who say, I have terrible abdominal symptoms, I have some chest symptoms, but oh my goodness, the feeling in my neck, I think I, I like that the least. So that's a, a variation. And so this person may have that ball feeling that feels suffocating. Uh, people just really dislike that feeling of the air at the sphincter and, and it just can't go. So I think the upper esophagus just below the sphincter probably gets stretched and it's just a nasty feeling. But this person says, I do burp a couple of times per day, but they're only micro. So since I burp a couple of times a day, do I have RCPD? And the answer is yes. When we say, I can't burp or no burp, I think what we really are meaning is either the three groups, 
a person who says, I've never burped in my life. I don't know what it would be like. I, I can't even speculate on how it would feel. I've never ever once burped in my life. Quite a few people say that. More commonly, people say, I have random burps, unexpected. I can't harness them. I don't know when they're going to happen. And they're always micro. And some people say that happens a few times a year. Some people say, say that happens uh, you know, every day or two or a few times a week. So uh, the idea is that the burping is insufficient. I can't harness it, and it doesn't provide relief. So the answer can be, now what this person needs to do is to see, do I match any of the other symptoms that I showed at the beginning? So there are subgroups of the can't burp. A can't burp can mean burping insufficiency. It doesn't necessarily mean total lack of burping. So in if, in if insufficient burps can qualify you. And again, we, because this is an internet question, I don't know if this person matches the other. Um, and when this person in the question referenced that he or she had undergone a lot of other tests that were normal. So I suspect this person probably does, but a uh, further discussion. And once in a while, uh, a Botox is the next test. So let's say this person matches half of the symptoms and but has done a lot of testing. Well, there comes a point when it's just logical to say, well, let's get this diagnosis on or off the table. And so Botox is a very simple, it is a test, and it should be the next one. So here's a person who says, are there plans to widely educate all medical practitioners about RCPD? This question came up a few times uh, in people who are frustrated by the, their difficulty finding someone who can help them. So you see, I got a lot of check marks there first. So let's see what it is that I'm going to say yes. Uh, various ways we can educate medical practitioners. One is medical journals. We personally have uh, published four uh, medical uh, peer-reviewed articles. They are open source, so even you can get to them. Uh, and they are all listed on Laryngopedia. They're easily available on Laryngopedia, that page that I showed you. And those journals articles can be printed out and, and taken to your doctors. There's a Dr. Karagama. He's the first person I explained this disorder to, first physician. And he's printed, uh, published a very nice article, uh, and maybe more. I don't know. I haven't kept up. So journal articles, uh, study groups. So in the United States, uh, Dr. Ox at uh, Johns Hopkins has started a group of us to, to try to study it and pool our, our understandings. Um, so this disorder has gone far and wide through the ENT community, especially in the United States. Uh, there are seminars and courses. I recently gave a Zoom course to a, to a big conference in India. Uh, so India now knows about it. A whole room full of people, doctors in India, now know about this. Um, I've done a Q&A, uh, the American Bronchological, uh, Bronchoesophological Society uh, did a, a Q&A, and that's available on YouTube. Online sources, there's Reddit, there's Behind the Prop Door, there's Laryngopedia. Laryngopedia, again, has a comprehensive page uh, where I try to just link everything imaginable uh, that people might want to find is right there on Laryngopedia. Just type in R hyphen CPD. Uh, there's the popular press. There's been an article on a, in a publication in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, let me think. I think there might have been one in Manitoba. I can't keep up with it. There's one upcoming in a, a, a major national newspaper. Uh, that's uh, coming out, I think, sometime in the near future. So the popular press, I can't keep up with the, oh, there's a, a suburban Chicago, a very big suburban Chicago paper. Um, there is general internet. Reddit, I think, is probably one of the biggest. There's a Facebook group. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, there's that idea of one doctor at a time. So I personally, I have had extensive interactions with doctors in, uh, in Holland, Belgium, Germany, Spain, uh, Finland, um, England, of course, that was the first, Dr. Karagama. 
uh, Australia. Uh, so anyway, the, it, it's really burgeoning and unfortunately in smaller cities and smaller places it may not have penetrated quite yet. But we're only 2019 to the present, so it's gaining momentum all the time. Here's a question nobody in my area knows about this. What do I do? A uh, common question. Well, the first thing I would say is your primary care doctor would likely send you to a gastroenterologist because all of the symptoms are GI. And GI doctors may eventually be the way in the, to, to finding help, but not yet. So I personally, if you are in a hurry and wanting to be efficient, I would not go to a GI doctor first. Uh, now, I certainly would if your problem is recent, but if you say maybe the symptoms have gotten unbearable recently, but basically when I think back, I've never been able to burp like other people, then what I would do is I would go to Laryngopedia, to that page I keep referencing, find the original publication of the original 51 that I published and is linked there. Uh, I think you can also find it by just Googling uh, the two words Bastion and Belch. It's a Sage pub article that go to Laryngopedia or just search it out and print it out. It's open source. It's peer reviewed, but it's open source. And so get that in your hand and then call larger ENT groups uh, and ask, does any of your doctors help people who can't burp? Again, the word is going out little by little. The GI uh, group, I have worked quite hard to, to kind of get my foot in the door. It's been very difficult. I think it's just beginning. The door is opening a crack. But I think the, the word has just exploded into the ENT community. And the ENT community is, is arguably the best uh, uh, prepared to do the actual Botox injection. And since we really don't need a lot of other testing, if, unless you're a recent onset, then uh, it sort of makes sense. Just go straight to the ENT group. I'm not being partisan. I, I'm just trying to help you be practical and uh, save time for you. So you call, call the larger ENT group in your area and ask, does any of your doctors help people who can't burp? If they've even done one person, I think the scheduler at the front desk will even know about it because this is a novel condition and it will have gone through the grapevine. Um, if no, call the next group and just keep calling ENT groups, larger ones, go online and search them out and, and, and concentric circles a little farther, a little farther from where you live and I think you're going to find someone who can do this. If you strike out, make a cold call to visit to the nearest laryngologist. Ask, well, it, nobody does this. Well, is there a laryngologist in your group, a voice swallowing and airway specialist? Uh, and that would be the person to go see, take your article and say, can you do this for me? Now, consider traveling. We have people here at Bastion Voice uh, who come from 50 states. We have all 50 states as of maybe as much as three years ago. We finally added Rhode Island. And so we have all 50 states and we have 22 countries. And the reason is that people have just struggled. We, we help them in this way, try to find someone local. One of the reasons people continue to travel is that sometimes, um, well, it's answered, let's go to this next question. I found someone who can do this, but they want a lot of tests first. Are they necessary? Um, I'm going to get a little controversial here, I'm sure. There would be doctors who would violently disagree with what I'm going to say, but here it is. If your inability to burp is recent, in other words, you burp like everyone else, and then in the last weeks, months, even year, you lost your ability, Probably, yes, you should do some testing. Uh, yeah, I think so. Especially if there's any swallowing uh, issue. Absolutely need some testing. If your inability to burp or your insufficient burping uh, is long-standing, it's debatable. I'm not sure you need any testing. I think you can go straight to Botox. Why do I say that? Because I said 1,300 as of May 2023, uh, current number 1,330. But those people, 1,300 people that we, our group here, has handled had thousands of tests come, you know, if we add them all up, you know, each person might have had, one person might have had 
six or eight tests, another might have had two, another might have had three. Some later in our series have had no tests. But still, if we add up all the tests that have been done, uh, thousands before coming to BVI, and absolutely zero correct diagnosis, zero. Uh, about 1,298, I say that because I personally, of the maybe 800 I have personally done, uh, there were two who didn't match the syndrome. I didn't do them because, well, I did one of them, it's a long story, but the other one I said, I'm sorry, you, you don't have RCPD. Uh, and so the rest of them, the 1,298, they matched the, the diagnosis. There are variations on a theme, so it's not like everyone has exactly the same story, but it's so easily diagnosed. It's a prima facie, on the face of it, diagnosis, syndromic diagnosis, that has extraordinary accuracy. And so in those people who match the syndrome, we validated the diagnosis in 100%. And I've got the 100% in quotes because there's a little wrinkle here, a little outlier situation there. But it's overwhelming that uh, they validate the diagnosis. And Botox treated them all too. So this is going to be your call. You have to kind of assess the doctor you're talking to and, and the relationship you have. But if it's me, and I've had this lifelong, or, or for many years, the inability to burp or, the burp or the insufficient burping, I think what I would say if a doctor said to me, well, yes, I'll do this, but first I need you to do this, 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 and this, I think I might figure out a way to say, well, doctor, I really appreciate your thoroughness, uh, but could I just go straight to Botox, and if it doesn't work, then do the test later? And the doctor might say, well, no, no, I think, and I'd say, well, you know, I just, I'm not really wanting to do those tests. I, I really feel that this is my problem. Now, there are doctors who will take offense at that. A lot of narcissism in medicism, medicine. But if you are dealing with a sort of a reasonable, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, collegial kind of a doctor, I think you could say that, that kind of thing. I just want to spare you going through all kinds of testing that, uh, based on our experience, never goes anywhere. Uh, the questions are, uh, are many, and so I don't know that I answered every question, but uh, videos get long, and so I think we'll stop here, and we're going to try to monitor questions still as they come in, and maybe every few months we'll uh, do another little Q&A like this if we go to go get a good response to this one. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, please, if you have RCBD, uh, press ahead and uh, get your, your relief from this terrible condition. Thank you.